Hello everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final webinar of Agile Management and Information Management. Agile Data and Information Management, I can read. A short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward, IT Masters Short Course MC. Your mentor, as usual, is Brendan Birchmore. Before we begin the usual housekeeping, uh, we encourage you to ask questions and use the chat function during the webinar. We ask that you direct all questions relevant to Brenton's content to the Q&A section where I can triage it and that you send all other questions, dates and times and resources availability, for example, to the support team in chat. You can chat with panelists only, which is Brenton, Hannah and me, uh, or to all of your fellow students. And you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you open the chat log. Usually there's some really experienced people in the in the webinars and they can help you with any sort of catch up questions you might have and, and probably flesh out some of Brenton's content in terms of uh, preferences about, you know, sort of uh, which which dashboard to use or, or whatever is going. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar um, and we'll talk as long as you need after that about the course exam, which we'll go through right at the end. Um, you can find the information at the course page as well. So um, there's no need to dwell on it. I guess the important thing is the, the webinars on the con and the content. And of course, Brenton, I think. Um, but if a question is particularly relevant, I'll interrupt Brenton. Um, and if you have any sort of worries about the exam, you can chuck a question in the chat and we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Hannah is here as usual. So hello and thank you, Hannah. Uh, Hannah's responsible for the, the course page, learn.itmasters.edu.au, which is where you'll find all of the other materials for the quiz, especially Brenton's audio lectures, um, which are always greatly valued and appreciated. So if you have any other questions, feel free to, to contact Hannah in there. That's enough out of me for now. Hello, Brenton. Uh, what tales? What news? What's going on? I'll Hello, Guy. Hello, you. Hannah. Hello, everyone. Welcome along. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, wherever you're listening and watching from. Thank you, Guy, for that lovely insight and thoughts on the spy thriller idea. I was a fan of Maxwell Smart, which a couple of people in the chat have mentioned. When I was younger, uh, it was a favourite show for me to watch after school. And I do think, <laughs> I, I do think that uh, you know the stereotypical chaos versus control, uh, chaos actually planned quite a bit. And if you look at the duo, Agent 86 and Agent 99, I think 99 was plan-based methodology and Maxwell was agile because his plans never went to plan as much as he tried. But interestingly, I don't think Max was ever beaten in a fist fight, was he? Uh, mm -hmm. Cannot confirm, but uh, I can confirm that uh, Maxwell missed it by that much. Thank <laughs> you, Mark Hilton. Um, yes, mm. regularly. And, and perhaps I should be put in a cone of silence from now on. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for the uh, great kickoff. We are at the fourth and final discussion of our journey into bits and pieces of agile data and information management. And alas, we don't have time to cover everything and we're not able to go into the true depths of everything that it can do for us. But hopefully we are scraping just enough off the surface for you to find it all very interesting. That's the goal. We are at the fourth and final pillar of what we are hoping to present to you with some wowing ideas, uh, some innovations, some new thoughts, and perhaps even a couple of insights along the way and see how we go with all of that today. Here's our syllabus of what we've been talking about. We have talked about the psychology of decisions. We did give a bit of an idea of what agile management might look like. We talked last week about data visualization and put even some nitty gritty into that. And tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about agile reporting. We're going to focus very much on the idea of, of the dashboard. It is the symbol of modern big data meeting agile decision making. It is really the nexus. It's the junction between everything that data could theoretically hope to one day do and the stuff we actually need it to do, which is you know, make us famous. So this is the point that we're going to focus on tonight and there are a million ways to do this and roughly half of those are the right way to do it and so what this means is we're going to hopefully uncover a few fundamentals a few ideas that will help you to find their own best right answer for what you want to do or how you need to do it now this is one week where i didn't put up a long list 
of web links for you to put up. I just put a few because I would really like and encourage you to have a look through those. So rather than sort of skim through and miss half of the links and just find the ones that you may or may not like, there's only a few up there. I do encourage you to have a look through them all. They are not the only nor are necessarily the best sources of ideas, but they are pretty good in giving you a starting point for what to think about, which is what a little bit of tonight is all about as well. So what we're going to talk about this evening, we will start to define agile reporting. We'll put a few fundamental building blocks on what reporting and information gathering looks like as it feeds into agile decision making. We will talk about dashboards in general, some basic philosophical ideas that underpin how our relationship should exist between agile reporting and agile decision making. We will go into a little bit of dashboard design. Dashboard design is a thing you could spend hours on. You could do an entire two day course just on dashboard design in, in theory. We won't, we have about 20 minutes that we're gonna to get to spend on it. So we will go to the fundamentals. And along the way throughout, we will be trying to bring all these ideas together and weave that into the way in which it affects our relationship with information. Now, as usual, as Guy has already mentioned, if you get questions about what I'm saying, what I'm talking about, comments, ideas, etc., things that you'd like me to respond to, put it in the Q&A box. If it's things that you'd like the rest of the audience to think about, consider and respond to, put it in the chat. And we have had some fantastic chat, some fantastic discussion and interactions over the last few weeks. So I'm sure that if good ideas are talked about, they'll get lots of traction. So let's start with a definitive. Let's try and nail down what it is we're talking about or, or what we refer to when we talk about agile reporting. And I wanna talk about what the information needs to do. What, what hoops does it have to jump through? What parameters, what attributes does it need to have in order to serve as agile, to be agile reporting? It's a few things that feed into the agile management paradigm that we've talked about. It does need to be just in time. It needs to be the latest information and just when we need it. We don't want a week old or two week old report that someone's been sitting on, got emailed to them, it's been in their in tray and now it's two weeks out of date. We want today's information. So it needs to be just in time, but it also needs to be highly tailored to whatever it is we need to figure out. What is our agile question? So going back to that discussion, we talked about a plan-based, contingency-based approach to management where we try and think of everything in advance. We think of what we want to do. We think of how and why that might not work. And we think of other implications or repercussions that might occur, and we try and plan ahead for that. In the agile environment, we need to be answering today's question. So we need to be clear on what our question is and we need to be clear on what information is gonna feed into that. So that relationship has to be tied up. It's also something where we have stakeholders that come together intermittently for a short period of time and they need to be able to get their head around whatever it is that the data is meant to be revealing quickly so that they can focus on the discussion, focus on the sharing of expertise and understanding and get to a decision. So the data needs to be presentable in a way that everyone can understand what it really means. And there's some things we'll touch on in a moment that lead to answering all these and achieving all these. Obviously the visualization needs to make sense and it has to have a few clear attributes. It's gotta be accurate. It's gotta be in some way verified and double checked. Uh, and it needs to be current, clear. There's a bunch of attributes that we'll talk about that uh, we'll need to have. So if this is a starting point of what we're saying, well, our job reporting needs to, our data needs to have this stuff loosely. What does that really mean? How are we gonna use it? What is this highly tailored question, et cetera? I wanna take an even higher step back. And I wanna talk about an agile dashboard and not talking yet about all of the things that can go on the dashboard. Let's talk about what any dashboard, a dashboard, the mere existence of a dashboard is meant to do for us as the viewer. Two things, two simple things, and everything devolves from that. Everything flows down from those two ideas. One is that it needs to be able to show you in some way, the results, the consequences, the fallout of previous decisions. And that's what we look at when we look at progress, we look at activity, we look at results, we look at what's gone on. Yes, that's what's happening, 
But what it really means is that's the result of the decisions that we made or didn't make or chose not to make or whatever happened previously, what's the, on the dashboard now about what's happened yesterday, the day before, last week. That's what it's telling us. And that's what the dashboard needs to do. We don't just present information because it's available, because we can, because it looks pretty. We present it because it is revealing to us the results of our prior decisions. Then logically, the next thing it needs to be able to tell us is to be some kind of trigger, some kind of agenda, some kind of list of what decisions we might need to look at or make next. So in a decision-centric management style, where everything comes out of making the best decisions in the moment, decisions, if they become the driving force behind our relationship with information, then this is what a dashboard needs to be able to do. And so everything, all the decisions that we might make from here on have to feed into one of these two criteria. They have to assist it, they have to contribute to it in some way. So with that in mind, we then look at some of the more details underneath that of what does that really look like? Where does that come from? So I mentioned a little two slides ago, I mentioned they have to be tailored to the question. Now, when we're looking at dashboards, there is a particular question sequence that I want to go through. And it's, it's not strictly linear, except the first and the last, they are quite linear. So the first point is the what question. Or what this is, is a question of what matters to me right now? What do I need to pay attention to today or this hour or this morning? So the question, the first question is what matters? We have a bunch of things visually displayed on our dashboard. Which one matters or which activity, which data point, which thing is of most relevant to me? Not just which report, but which decision matters to me first? Which one tells me that a decision might be on the cards here? The why question is once we've established that something needs some further attention, needs some investigation, it's interesting. It's maybe positively or negatively, but it's interesting. Then well, why is it interesting? What are the underlying or contributing forces or factors to it? Then we want to know how urgent is it? What priority should we assign to this? Is this a decision that's going to be needed to be made today or tomorrow or the next day or next week? What are the repercussions of the timing of it? Who do we need to make? that decision with? What expertise might we need to have and provide input? Or what stakeholders are going to be affected by this and therefore need to be brought in to manage their, their consequences? And the last question we're looking at is, well, how do we go about fixing this? How do we make this decision now? What do we do about it? So this first point, the starting point for most dashboards is that that's what they're answering. They're helping us determine the what question. And what we see on the, the base dashboard is usually primarily giving us that. The next layer, which might be a click away, is gonna be giving us this. Why is that so? What does it really mean? How urgent is this? Who else do I need to involve with this? This is the machinations of the analysis. So when we talked, previously about visualization, we talked about you first need to have a question and then you have an analysis. Well, this is the question, this becomes the analysis. Subsequent questions that you need to get answered. And then this becomes the decision itself. So the decision is things that changes something. Up here, you're talking about the discovery, the realization, the understanding. Here, you're now changing the future. And that's an important shift. We talked about the agile management in week two. We talked about the way in which we make a decision that then makes something new happen or something different happen. But we, we can do that because we've determined who's involved, who needs to be involved, and we've determined when the decision needs to be made, which meeting, what rhythm, how, how urgent do we need to respond to this. But going right back to the top, that's where our dashboard helps us. The dashboard doesn't need to solve all of this for us, not on the first screen. It's okay if this is a click away, a 
chart that needs to be blown up, something that needs to be popped out, something that needs to be manipulated, some data input, some filter that might need to be applied, something that changes the way we interact with that data or that visualization. That's okay when we start answering these questions. So what this feeds into in our dashboard design, our dashboard implications is that we want our dashboard to do one thing first and other things secondarily or other things as a subsequent step. So we don't necessarily need to be trying to cram everything onto a dashboard that tells us everything about everything in one go because we might get caught up in the details of why things happen because our dashboard is trying to put that in our mind. We might miss some other thing, some other what question that we needed to pay attention to, but we missed it in the noise and we didn't make that decision. So let's look at the what question types and break them down into three different types of questions. Now, when you look at some of these sites, when you look at some of these links that I've given you and other places, some of these will be phrased differently and they'll be structured a little differently. I've given this structure for some fairly important reasons, which will hopefully be revealed as we talk through it. So we're breaking the what question down even further. So we've established that the what question what do I need to answer? What do I need to investigate? What do I need to design? Three different levels. The functional type of question is what relates to the daily business as usual. The normal functioning activities of the organization, which might not be smooth today. They might not be, the, might not be running as usual for some reason. So we want data that will tell us when there's a bump in the road. A separate type of what question is, Contingent questions. These are questions that talk about bigger threats. This is the business as unusual. This is the stuff that isn't gonna get solved with a quick call, a corridor conference, or bumping into a colleague and say, hey, this has just happened. What do we do about that? Oh, we do this now. Okay, let's do that. That's functional. But when we now need to say, okay, so you know, Fred and Mary are working on this, they're gonna to have to stop working on that and they're gonna to have to work on this instead because if we don't, by the end of the month, that's gonna be a disaster. That's contingent questions. We're now reacting with our resources. Then you have opportune what questions. The opportune questions are the more strategic and they're often called strategic, but I refer to them as opportune questions because they're not strictly strategic. They could be tactical, but they're the kinds of decisions and questions that you don't necessarily need to make in order to have business as usual continue to function. You could have business as usual still being usual, but you might miss some other change, some other bigger opportunity that would have delivered more value, some improvement. These are the things that the daily grind makes it hard at times for us to look at, for all of us to look at. But some, though, some roles, that's their job, looking at those possibilities, looking at what the future could be, not what the future might be. Not, not this is what the future might do to us. And not this is just what today is doing to us, but where could we go? So if we break down the what, in these three different ways, we have a way to approach how to lay out a dashboard to cater for these three types of questions. So Here's Brenda, just, just before you continue, um, yes, uh, if we go back to that last slide, Brendan's asking, would, would the what be one of the hardest questions or decisions about making a, a dashboard? Um, and, and would it sort of, I guess, uh, my question as well is, is sort of, would it correspond to sort of the strategic questions in the agile leadership program how, how does this sort of is, is this the strategic and then someone else is responsible for the micro is this all part of how the dashboard gets created i think this slide might somewhat answer that question because the difference is role based every role is going to have a different ratio of which of those three matters more to them so some roles will be very much more focused on different levels. But what that links to and what that relates to is here when we talk about uh, functional questions of the micro decisions and they will get made right. on a short cadence. Hmm. So they might get addressed every day or every couple of days or whatever rhythm 
that you have your short scale agile decision making on. And this is the remove the typical and minor blockers. This is the thing where we said, well, you know, we wanted to do this. It was meant to be yesterday. It hasn't been today. The supplier hasn't delivered. And that's where someone says, well, I, you know, I, I know someone at the supplier. Why don't I give them a call? Right. They give them the call problem solved that arrives that afternoon. That's business as usual, dealing with the hiccups and the bumps. And that's what functional questions, functional, the functional what is typically dealing with. So that equates to in an agile and project sense, that's your daily stand-up kind of problem solving. So what we're trying to do is encapsulate what kind of data feeds do we need to see in our organization to know about the daily bumps in the road and deal with them on a daily basis. And that's talking about functional problems, functional questions, functional decision-making. Now, Brendan's question about, are they similar to a SWOT analysis? I would suspect that the SWOT analysis is more likely to be used the deeper down you go. You could certainly use a SWOT analysis uh, in, the, in any of these layers. And I don't think there's a clear argument that says, well, any particular kind of, a, of analysis is going to be appropriate at a, one level and not at another. So if, you, if your functions, your roles and what you do means that certain kind of analysis and certain methods of investigation do line up with certain types of questions, then that would make sense for you. But I don't think that's universal. So looking further down, the contingent questions, these are macro decisions because these are bigger threats. The functionals, you still have threats. You still have little problems that come up, but they can be solved within this time frame, and they can solve, be solved within normal operational boundaries. When they can't, they're a contingent question. This is a situation where, well, we need this done by next week. Well, Mary knows how to do that, but Mary is on holidays next week. So we need to pull someone else in off their other tasks. We need to reallocate resources. There are decisions because there are bigger impact, bigger implications for the generation of value and the application of resources. So we're making decisions that immediately affect more stakeholders immediately affect other expressions of value. We can't just say to Fred, like, stop your work for next week, do Mary's job because Mary's job's more important. Well, what about Fred's job? And what about what value that would normally bring? How do we make that decision? That's a contingent decision. It's depend upon something. It's conditional on something. And we need to have those conditional data points brought in to the discussion and brought into the decision. So we're broadening the stakeholders and we're broadening the data feeds that need to be applied to how to make that decision. And we're lengthening the time scale of when we want to do something, when we want to see results and how long we're going to wait for taking action on it. Similarly, take it to the next step. The opportune questions are the ones that say, well, uh, maybe we should hire another person to do this. Or maybe Fred and Mary should have complete role changes. Or maybe we need to buy a piece of software, buy a piece of equipment, buy, spend some money that's bigger than simply fixing a problem. And if we do that, we will be able to generate more value. Now, when we do this, we're usually talking about business justification. We're talking about a business case. We're talking about how does this line up with the strategic goals? The strategic goals suddenly become relevant. And that's why we often use these or talk about these as strategic decisions. Now, these aren't hard and fast boundaries. We have to decide where things fit. But the existence, the creation of a framework like this gives us a starting point for how we might structure a dashboard depending on what kinds of questions the user of that dashboard usually has to deal with. What are they usually responding to? I've got some examples to talk about in a moment. So these give us insights or a starting point for saying, well, what visualizations do you want? But what this is hopefully starting to build a picture of is that the dashboard is not a report. It's not a reporting tool. It's a thinking space. It's an environment that is meant to create 
the right kinds of thoughts, the right opportunities to think and decide and investigate so that we can make the best decisions. So I called it a mental desk. It's a space where we have what we're working on at the moment or what we should be working on at the moment or what we should be working on next. So we interpret everything that's there visually because it's on a screen. It always has a deeper meaning. There's always things to interpret or imply. There's always forces that work behind whatever we see on the dashboard. So there's always a deeper meaning available to us. And it's usually just a click away. And it's a source of stress and hope because it's what tells us that we have to do something. It's what tells us where our problems are and where our problems are is usually where our work needs to go. But it also tells us where we're gonna find some answers. Has anyone ever been guilty of emotional reporting? And I call it emotional reporting, it's happiness reporting. This is where you get a little bit stuck looking at the good news results, looking at the good reports, looking at the green numbers, looking at the, the visualizations where the needle's all the way over in the right. You get a bit guilty sometimes of looking at those and saying, oh, I'm gonna spend a few minutes just gloating over how good these numbers are. And, and look, nothing wrong with that, but that's how deep our relationship with that kind of signaling can be, because it's a signal. It's a signal to us saying, well, yeah, we're doing well here, but what about when it's not? What does that do to us when we're perhaps a little bit low on patience today, a little bit low on tolerance, a little bit low on sleep, and we then have to look at something that is clearly a source of stress. So the dashboard brings us both. And inevitably, because the dashboard is the trigger of our or the, the trigger for change in our emotional state, then we have a relationship with it. It does things to our feelings. There's just no escaping that. And so acknowledging that and being aware of, okay, it's an important thing is part of building its picture of a mental desk. And we would want to arrange it and respect it and have it respect us in the same way that we would any other personal working space give it that level of attention to detail. This also raises the point about, well, customization of a dashboard to an individual. I prefer the term, and one of the links talks about it, personalization can be viewed a little bit differently to customization. Personalization is this, it's creating a mental desk. It's creating the elements that are meaningful to that individual. It's not just what data do I need to see, but it's how do they personally interact with it. A few key points to think about when we think about the user experience. Now UX uh, is short for user experience and it talks about the interaction, the relationship that a user has or the experience that they have when they interact with it. Dashboards are one of the most important user experience design decisions or processes that we go through when we're using these sorts of things. Why isn't it well, UE? How very upsetting, I'm sorry. You, uh, I, that's, that's because UX is easier to say. Yes, but honestly. It, vowel consonant. <laughs> sorry. It's linguistics, <laughs> I'm afraid. It's all Perhaps it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's no it, doubt. It's, uh, I, it's a perfect example of of uh, perhaps the opposite of the the, the green uh, syndrome, where it's you, you only look at the good things, you only look at the red things, you only look at the nasty things, you only look at the cynical things. And there was a bit of chat about that. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. So yeah, but yes, you're right. It's it's two vowels don't often get used as as comfortably as a vowel and a consonant. Um, but, and um, I think I, I've spotted Avi's question there. Uh, I, I think that um, I might have a, an answer for that when I put up some layout examples in a moment. So hold on to that thought and we might be able to answer that in a second. So a few key points that I wanna put on this slide about what are some of the key principles of dashboard UX. We wanna get efficiently to the next what question, right? But 
we need just enough space dedicated to that output to do that. That's, if that's its job, then that's all the space it needs to be able to do that. So having, for example, like one thing in the top left-hand corner that's big and it's just a number and it just tells you your attainment percentage of a certain success KPI that you're looking at and it's a big number and it's important because it's really big, but what is it really telling you? Well, it doesn't tell you anything unless it crosses certain thresholds, right? And you're going to notice when it crosses certain thresholds. Does it need to have that much space? It only needs to have enough screen real estate to do its job. And that is to let you know when you need to pay attention to the reason why it's saying what it's saying. And yeah, maybe that means that it needs to be a bit bigger than something else, but maybe not as big as you first thought it should be. That's a, a litmus test for how big does it really need to be? Just big enough to do its job, which is at this in the what question, if that's all it's doing, that's all it does. Now, if it's more than that, if it's giving a little bit more than the what question, if it's got a little bit more detail and it's a bigger, longer visualization, maybe it'll need a bit more space because you need to be able to see the detail. Don't squeeze a complex visualization into a small space because it's gonna, a, a more complex visualization is going to have more triggers, more what questions available within it. So it's gonna need a bit more space to express those. Now the why question be, can begin a click away. You don't need to answer, why is it like this? Why is this only 50%? Well, you don't need to be able to answer that straight up just by looking at the first layer graph, but you do need to know that, okay, that's a question I need to answer now. What else can I get access to? Let's blow this chart up. Let's blow this table up. And I, I don't mean with explosives. I mean, let's magnify it. Let's change some filters. Let's remove some filters. Let's look at this a little bit differently. And that might be a click or two. So the positioning of something, the size of something will be its importance and the job it needs to do to answer the what question. Color typically indicates urgency or severity. And I'm going to play a trick on you in a moment to illustrate that. Here's some examples. I've got three different roles here and I've very abstractly defined these. These are some examples of how layouts can change based on these three different questions. And I'm not proposing that these are the right for these managed because these are very generic roles. What I'm trying to illustrate in a moment is what to think about when you think about how much space for what kind of question. So imagine a business as usual line manager, someone who is responsible for the daily grind. And they need to ensure that the daily grind is grinding away in a usual fashion and not an unusual fashion. So their dashboard might look a little bit like this. They might have this big area here that's mostly showing the majority of their business as usual reporting. And this might be their primary thinking space because they're looking for wrinkles, hiccups, bumps in the business as usual. But they've got to keep their eye on this because these things need to get talked about every so often. And these might lead to these. So they need a deeper level of reporting and quite possibly this, this stuff down here, this might be reporting over a longer time period. Whereas this might be looking at yesterday, last three days, this might be looking at last three weeks, looking at different trends over a different period of time. As a simple example, this might be looking at, this is outcomes, perhaps results. This is effort, this is input. This is what the team are performing. This is how the team interact. This might be attendance. This might be participation, whereas this is outcome. When you look at these together and you say, okay, participation is starting to, well, hang on, here's a big gap here. It's, we're, we're missing three people next week. What, what the heck is that? What's going on? And we, when we discover, we look deeper, we say, oh, we've approved one person's holiday and then this person is sick and that this person's on compassionate leave. That's a contingency problem I need to solve. And if I don't solve it, guess what's going to happen to these numbers at the end of next week? So I've got some visibility here, but I can't miss out on this. 
I might be just managing the daily grind, but I still need to be able to see the sorts of things that help tell me whether or not there's a better way to meet the strategic goals, to meet the longer, larger KPIs. We should look at those when we can, even if our mind and our role and our job description tells us that we live in the daily grind, we occasionally need to keep an eye on something over there on the right-hand side. Now, I've laid these out in this way, just as an example. You might say, well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the contingents over here, and I'm gonna put the opportunity down here, and that could be fine. But the point is, we're segregating the question visually on the page. We're creating that differentiation that says, when you're typically looking in this area, you're typically thinking about these things. This is your thinking space for this. And over here is your thinking space for that. We're not mixing them up and letting our eyes wander from graph to graph and just figure out, okay, what do I need to do with this graph now? Or which graph do I feel like looking at? What's well, probably going to be the one that's changed color the most, or it's going to be the biggest or the happiest. So that's one example, one template, right? Let's look at another one. Let's say we're talking about a very strategic manager, perhaps more with an executive set of responsibilities, sitting at a layer in the org chart that's above the data grind. They might be saying, well, I'm more responsible for the decisions regarding the allocation of resources. I manage things to do with short-term budgets. I manage the monthly pipeline. I manage things, the decisions about who works in what area or where do we spend our money for marketing or you know, where do we advertise next week? Or which sales, which product is not selling enough so I need to spend more money on that. This is where I might have those decisions. And over here, I'm looking for ways to do it better next month or next quarter because that's my role, that's my job. I'm solving this month's problem and I'm solving next quarter's problems, but I'm not solving today's problems. That's someone else who has a different dashboard. But I'm not totally disconnected from the daily stuff because what's reporting down here, we might use this to help us answer these questions, these contingency things we might need to look at the dailies to see, well, why is this the case? And therefore, what do I need to do about it? And then who do I need to pull into a decision? And how urgent is this anyway? So this might be a better ratio for what's more important, the weightage, as Avi has asked about. One more. Imagine a functional expert. Now, if you're talking about IT, I'm imagining a layer, a level two or even level three expert, technical expert, someone who deals with a very select range of problems. Their dashboard might look a little bit like this. They might say, well, I'm here to solve the big problems. This is where I live. This is the big issues that I tackle every day. I'm the one that's constantly solving the bigger problems. I'm the one that's dealing with the fact that if we don't solve this, the daily grind will be much worse later. And I bring my expertise into this thinking space, that's what I do. And that might be how that is structured. But they might still need to have access to the daily grind to spot alarms, bumps in the road that my expertise recognises as something a little bit more than a bump in the road. It's this stuff that I bring my expertise to because if I don't, it'll end up up here. So I want to see things here that are the kinds of things that my expertise can help prevent it from becoming something up here. But at the same time, I have something that looks to the future because I'm dealing with the bigger problems that we face. And quite often, I can't fix them with duct tape. I need to say, okay, we need to invest in some money to do this. We need to hire someone. We need to buy this thing. We need to do this differently. And that's going to remain opportune type investigation. It might mean a mini project. It might mean some other changes, big changes that many stakeholders or at least more stakeholders are not going to need to get. So I've got to keep an eye on that. I've got to keep an eye on the sorts of things that might mean big changes in the future opportunities to deliver value differently, not just fix things, but build a better mousetrap. So 
The idea about these different layouts is not to tell you, okay, this is how you should lay it out. It's to say, this is a way of thinking about layout that creates this strong relationship between the data feed, the decision processes that individuals need to go through and the way that contributes to agile decision-making and agile management. It's that link that I'm trying to help illustrate through all of this. I believe we have a poll. Oh, the guys are already ready with it. Oh, yes. Super interesting one. How effective is the use of dashboards in your organization? Unknown. Don't use them enough to rate their effectiveness. Selective, effective, and great. I would be so interested in seeing what and how some of you listening out there use. Um, so if there's some way of sharing what you do use in the forums, you know, redacting what is necessary. I would be so keen on that. Um, of course, you know, don't, don't do anything you shouldn't. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm super interested in looking at, at what you've got out there and, and sort of discussing the benefits and, and what positive effects you do have and some of the limitations of the way you do it. I think that's a great idea. There's, there's nothing to beat experience familiarity, trial and error that someone else has already done. And they've discovered things. This, this is an area, and I think this poll helps illustrate this, right? 43% have said that it's selective. Mm. Dashboards aren't foreign to that group of people, but they're not common and comfortable to that group of people. They're not ubiquitous. They're not, they're not the tool that they could be, perhaps. So, and, yeah. and yet, there's some degree of success or conquest in there. And if, if more of us shared that, and the forums here is a great place to, to do a little bit of that for those of you who have something, uh, as Guy suggested, it's a great way to share that little bit that you might already have mastered and learn a little bit from what someone else has mastered and broaden that scope. And hopefully you move yourself down the line in the poll. <laughs> yeah, and, and it looks like there's certainly scope for that because you know, some 70% of people, from the looks of it, are either selective or unknown. Um, so yeah. yeah, and three times as many don't do it at all than those who do it great mm. or have it great. Mm. Yeah, I'll just uh, share so the results for you all. We, we are at the early stages of the maturity of this. If you talk about, if we say that you know, Agile agile project is kind of not new anymore. It's been around for you know, more than a decade. We're still, a lot of us, getting our head around it. But this, this the, the big data is, is kind of not as new as it once was, but agile management, the use of dashboards, the way that impacts our work, our thinking space, that is new. Hmm. And we're all learning how to do it. And there's no right and wrong yet. I mean, we're barely struggling to put formulas together at the moment. Mm, yeah, it's it's the various measures of, you know, or, or various metrics that you can measure and then feeding that into the dashboard, to me, that seems the issue. Like, I'm just thinking of my own workplaces from, you know, years gone by, and I have no idea how the data that will be necessary to actually make the sorts of decisions you've been talking about on those three previous slides would actually feed in nicely. So um, for me, it's, it's super interesting to, to sort of consider what is possible if you, if you actually have that. Uh, yes, but that then opens an evolutionary journey because one of the most common points of feedback that I get from people is that they say, look, it, even if your dashboard told me so much more about what I could do, I don't have the bandwidth to do it. I don't have time to do mm. it, right? How do, I, how do I add value? And the counterpoint to that is, well, if you knew exactly where you could add the most value, you could, as you mentioned before, triage that, you could do the best things for your delivery of value. Wouldn't that be better? <laughs> but then there's the question of, well, yeah, but that's not what my boss wants me to do that's not what the company asks me that's not what my kpi says so there's a maturation process here happening in parallel there's what can the data tell us there's how can we interact with that data meaningfully and positively and then how can we evolve management to be willing to find recognize and embrace the fact that we just learned how to do our jobs better and we should embrace that and we should be doing this now because what we thought we needed to do wasn't quite right 
that's agile at work and, and that's part of the journey and it's happening multi-pronged simultaneously through the industries. Excelsior. <laughs> Inspirational. That's why it's hard, but it's inevitable because the good news is there. You can point to it. All we're waiting for is for the parallel systems of management, workers, and data reporting to all line up and, I guess, decision making. So when you get all those things lining up with similar maturity, those organizations that can do that will succeed. They will win. They will achieve more. They'll deliver more value. And the more organizations that do that, the more their customers will want and appreciate that. And then it'll be just like every other evolution that the business world has ever seen. Uh, there'll be those that get on board and succeed and those that fall by the wayside and don't. Hmm. It's just one more thing in that, in that evolutionary blender. And is it fair to say that sort of the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the, the, the large companies that have the ability to adopt these new ideas with larger budgets uh, I'm so sure. are sort of advantaged or is it that the small ones can actually change their systems quickly enough and, and maybe put enough time into it that, that they can actually benefit from it too? I think medium business has the advantage now. Because hmm you need enough investment to be able to leverage this stuff. And frankly, it's extraordinarily cheaper than it ever was. It's the, the cloud computing phenomenon has turned everything into a service. And if you can build then and justify the cost of that service into your cost of goods, because you can leverage it into value, then small business, medium business can do that. Big business struggles because big business is often planning further in advance. They have longer term strategies. They have, uh, more hierarchical structure. And so their decision-making and their distribution of power and authority is more strict. It is more difficult for them to be able to react in an agile manner to these things. So whilst they have money to throw at the systems, they don't have the company culture to respond to the answers. Um, so you need to be small enough to be nimble, but big enough to embrace and have discipline. So really small startups uh, struggle because they're so nimble that it's a little bit harder for them to develop culture out of this. Uh, they tend to be more reactive than that even. So. Mm, thank you. Right, let's carry on. Get to our final point. A few more things to, to share along the way. A few more information attributes. Some of you might have already encountered these before. I won't go into them in too much detail, but these are attributes that information can have. And some of these you might think, oh, I didn't think about that as an attribute of information. But when we are bringing information into our decision-making, we want to know, for example, how up-to-date is it? Information has a currency attribute. It's, it's how current is it? How aligned is it amongst the stakeholders? A piece of information is not intrinsically what it is. It is what everyone perceives it to be. We talked about that last week, right? It's what people perceive it to be because that, their perception, that's what's going to influence their decision. So alignment is an attribute of the information. It's kind of like, what does it smell like? It smells different to you than it does to me. Therefore, it's going to impact us differently. Timeliness. How quickly do I get it? do I have access to it at the right time? And this is what dashboards are a part of, giving you quick access and giving you currency, right? Relevance, is it relevant to what? We just talked through the relevance of trying to create some sort of framework for what kind of visualization, what kind of data tool is relevant to what kind of problem. The ability to attribute data to certain sources, the ability to attribute it to uh, what does it say versus who provides that? And attribution, when you're talking at numbers, you might say, well, that's, that comes from that system. It might not come from a person. It might not be from a who. It, it might be from another thing. But the ability to trace back attribution is going to help us answer a bunch of other contingencies and a bunch of other attributes of the information. So, well, if it comes from there, can we trust that? Maybe it comes from a customer. It comes from a supplier. 
Maybe it's un therefore unverified, we treat it a little differently, which leads us to the question of validity. Can we verify it? It says it's accurate, but we've only applied one test to that accuracy, therefore it's not verified. Nothing's verified unless you have at least two tests applied. When you have two tests applied to a piece of data and they correlate, then you have some kind of verification. Now that doesn't mean you have to verify everything, but it means you have to know what's verified and what's not. Because unverified data often should be treated a little differently to verified data. We might allow it to influence decision-making a little bit differently. The format in the application, this is what we talked about last week when we talked about visualization techniques. How usable is that? You've got a bunch of data, it's really just a bunch of data. How useful that is will often depend a great deal on exactly how it's visualized. And lastly, how does it feed into our ability to link to the vision, the strategic goals? That's how well does this data point link back to our reason for existence, which is why we have a company or corporation or organization and why we exist and why we have a job and why, why all this stuff happens all the way down to why do we have this data point? There is or needs to be ultimately some sort of connectivity. Because if we're spending too much of our time on data that doesn't actually link back to our reason for existence, then we have a disconnect that could be an existential threat. Now that sounds dramatic, but when you have enough of that, that's when you have departments that go off on a tangent doing stuff and doesn't align with the strategic vision or the strategic vision changes and we say, let's, we don't need that department anymore, let's just get rid of it. Or we don't need that company anymore or we don't need these people, whatever the case may be. Or we don't need to sell that product anymore because we're not selling enough of it. Well, we're not selling enough of it because we can't make it fast enough. That would be an odd problem to have, wouldn't it? So a few dashboard tips, and we are at the, we are managing to squeeze in a, a final few slides within the hour. Doing and so well. uh, then, then we'll have time for Q and A. Dashboard tips, here's a few tips to think about. Uh, only put what's needed in the space to do its job. And that means think about what its job is. And that's going to be a much more complicated process for you than what I just put up in my slides. But hopefully you have a few extra things to think about when you're deciding what is needed in the space and only as big as it needs to be to do its job. Be concise, use symbols, use abbreviations, but use the same ones. So use the, if you use something for minutes, M-I-N, well, use the same M-I-N all the time. Don't put sometimes M, because that might be millions, right? So use the same abbreviations, use the same uh, symbology, use the same things across an organization. And round your numbers. This is just a small tip that says, well, if you, if you want to see meaningful change, round it to the next meaningful number because you don't necessarily want people to be reacting to irrelevant change. You want them to react to relevant change. So round to the point of relevancy. Consistency, I've already hinted at this. Uh, the second point here is probably a bigger one I wanna make, display the same data in the same format. When you're displaying sales figures over a period of time, display it the same way for everybody. Now, yeah, there's, that does come up against a personalization issue and that's fine but you would use for example the same time scale or the, the same way that you display it you might they might have different filters or they're putting different data points in there but your graph will have the same visual components uh, you might use the same visual elements same colors for the same things so that when you look at a sales graph no matter what period of time and no matter what product you're talking about you know that's a sales graph for last week because you recognize the shape, you recognize those visual elements. Use that because as we talked about before, we talked about pre-attention processing. People process and prioritize what they're familiar with. Make this stuff familiar to them. And don't scroll. Um, so this is part of web and uh, digital UX. Anything that you have to scroll to see is not gonna answer the what question. Now, if you turn around and say, okay, all of my what questions are above the scroll, and I am gonna have a scroll down, so 
but you scrolled in to get all of the why, when, who questions. That might work. That might work for some people. But in general, it's generally better to have a pop-up or an enlarging uh, graph or chart or visualization or pop it out in another tab or something else. You are typically better off creating layers within the same visual space than creating depth off the screen, typically. That's a UX fundamental that is just as relevant in dashboard design. Uh, and the way I do it is that I use multiple tabs and I can click out things into certain tabs and then look at those tabs one by one in my browser interface or whatever. Because as tabs, they're easy to manage rather than pop outs which are then their own window that I have to then move and, you know, alt tab to find them when I've lost them because they've gone underneath something, etc. Different tools, different software will have different options for you in how to do that. But that's a general uh, tip to think about. Mm. And, and is this generalized to, to sort of all sorts of presentation of, of things? Whether it's, yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It, it comes from the below the fold principle that's been well understood in paper printing for a very long time, right? Uh, below the fold is stuff that doesn't get read. Mm. Uh, below the fold, in the, the, the newspaper problem, right? You, the newspaper folded in half. Yeah. The stuff above the fold gets read to, at some extraordinarily higher percentage than what gets read below that fold. And that's where the idea began. And that was an acknowledgement of that's just the way the brain works. And that applies in browsing and, and below the fold now relates to scrolling. Hmm. Or shrinking the broad sheet into, yeah. a, into a small yeah. paper. So scrolling is akin to turning the page. Hmm. And Actually, Nick, yes, we can still use now. clip art in, in the chat. So thank you. <laughs> Traps and pitfalls. We've attended to some of these already. But the first one is context. You know, not everyone will see the same info or interpret the same meaning from it when they look at anything on a graph dashboard, any visualization. Uh, and not everyone cares about the same problem as we do. So when you get the who question, they're like, who are we going to pull into this? Just because we care about it doesn't mean that they care about it. And that doesn't mean that they have the same chart on their dashboard and that they know all about it. Quite possibly not. So we might need to be taking the step to step over the fence, step over the boundary and help other people see the data that we need them to see to get their contribution. And there's always stuff that just doesn't translate. I mean, we know things that's hard to explain. And if it's hard to explain, how much harder is it going to be to try and portray in a visual tool? Some, and this is the why question, right? Some why questions, are really quite difficult to explain and may need to be looked at with multiple different visualizations, looking at the same problem or the same question from multiple different angles. And just because you have it all looking the same and understood the same doesn't mean that there's agreement. This is where your information attributes have a role to play. Uh, some things are more easily argued because they're not verified, because they're not up to date, because uh, they're not from a trusted source, because they're not attributed, they're not date stamped, or there's elements with the attributes that weaken their strength and usefulness. And so they become subject to argument. And the world is grappling with some scientific facts that are subject to argument for some really odd reasons at the moment. And you need to look no further than that to see a good example of how humans respond very differently to what others consider to be quite obvious. So we're wrapping up, then we're going to grab some questions. Now's a good time to think of your questions. Closing points. I, this is trying to close off the entire four week topics uh, in a few lines. Here's, the, here's how it goes. Agile management relies upon agile decision making. Agile decision making relies on agile reporting. That's a fairly obvious logical sequence. But the presentation, the arrangement, the alignment of what the meaning is behind the data is what really matters. It's the meaning and the meaning only exists by the, within the human's minds. It's us 
that gives it meaning. It's us that turns it into value. It's us that has to recognize the value and it's us that has to appreciate the value that can be gained by from any of this, any of this agile stuff that we might do. But when you do get a team of stakeholders that truly understand the same data, the same up-to-date information, the same situation, and they agree on what's causing it, then the best decisions, which is what agile relies upon, then they become possible. And that's the, the multi-pronged evolution that I talked about a little while ago, where you know, that's where when you get these things working, uh, you can get the best results for the organization. But it all has to work together. Thanks, Brenton. Let's just sit with so, that for a while. There's some questions coming in. Excellent. Amazing chat. Uh, We'll give it a couple of minutes before cutting off the questions. There's only seven and now's a good time to add your exam questions as well. And we'll just do it all in one little, little session. Shall I sneak this slide in? This is, we'll put this up for people to, to, just to be reminded that there's more to this than just the short course. Oh yes, all of that. There's, there's, there's all this other stuff that, that goes on, et cetera. So. Yeah, actually, now's a good time to say uh, if you've enjoyed this short course, which I'm sure you have, um, and would like us to flesh it out in a paid subject, we'll need to make the subject, which is to say we'll need Brenton to make the subject. So, Hannah, if you could please chuck in the, the survey link, um, that would be wonderful. And in that sort of course survey, you can sort of uh, chuck your feedback in there and it'll help us make the future courses better for one thing and also help us sort of identify whether or not this is a subject that would have some legs down the track. Um, but yeah, you've got other short courses, other post-grad courses, and of course, lots of university subjects uh, that would tangentially, I think, touch on, on some of the topics here, um, but which, you know, might warrant some, some further drilling. So, yeah. All right, well, uh, let's go back to the last slide because I think, you know, that's important, Brenton. Um, and we'll get Hannah, you can um, please to cut off any questions that come from now. Um, and we'll, we'll just go through all the questions. Sure, let's do that. So let's start and we'll see, we'll start with the bottom, I think. Is it good practice to make dashboards geospatial? Uh, Stephen asks, for example, we have these risks and they are at these locations or departments or whatever, but also show linkage? I think it can be. I mean, that's a question that's gonna be very much dependent upon what it is you do. Uh, if you're, for example, facilities management, then that would be an excellent way of determining uh, or, or positioning data. Uh, because if your response is often geospatially oriented, then it makes sense that your question is gonna be geospatially oriented as well. And so I don't know that you could answer that question in a generic sense, but I think that uh, if you have something that's location relevant, then absolutely that's a good way of creating meaning out of that data that's relevant to the way you make your decisions. But it really comes down to how do you make your decisions? You know, if, if you're talking about a particular building or a particular rack or a particular something, and you want to know everything that's going on in that because you want to bring all that information together to make a decision about it. But that's exactly how you can benefit from geospatial uh, reporting tools. When, when you're going about sort of deciding what to put in there or what, what to represent, uh, what, what proportion of businesses would sort of go it alone and create their own dashboard? And what proportion would sort of go out and buy something off the shelf and then have these sort of third parties discuss with them what they need to put in there? Oh, I, I think that, um, look, there was a period of time where a lot of companies would just grab a tool and think that they know their business, they know their work, they'll just figure it out. And I think for a lot of organizations, and I think the poll might have hinted at this, that hasn't always been successful because there is a bit of an expertise and a knowledge gap about exactly how do you do all this sort of stuff. Yeah, we know how to do our thing, but how do we bring all of this big data into it? That's not quite so easy. But investing in the kind of consulting expertise 
to get help with that. Not every company is either can or willing to afford to invest in that. But more and more companies are seeing that that kind of investment can bring real dividends to the efficiency and the value and uh, the workplace and how everything works more harmoniously. So there is a greater appreciation for that. I also think that this is now being simplified into courses that um, employees can go along and attend. You no longer need to bring in your big consultant who mysteriously knows stuff to answer all these for you. There's ways now that you can do courses, you know, short courses, far more technical than this. You can do courses about how to do certain, use certain software. So I think there's a growing trend towards making it easier and easier and more and more accessible. And what I have tried to position to you all over the last four weeks is what I feel is the last or, or, or the biggest of the last missing, missing ingredients. It's that, that mesh, that glue that brings it together. Because you can learn all about a tool, and you can learn all about big data, and you can learn data science, and you can learn management, but there's still that little bit of the coupling that needs to happen. Thank you. Um, so fair to say, uh, anonymous attendees question, in your experience, what are the better popular software softwares available for dashboard designs? For example, Power BI or Tableau. It just sort of depends on the needs and the, the wants and the what the benefit, like what the advantages of the specific product are? Yeah, I mean, that question, uh, to be honest, I think a lot of the people here and a lot of the people that I'm hopefully going to post their views on the forums will probably have a, a better answer, a more complete answer than me because I'm not in a position where I'm constantly using them. So I have a, a broad theoretical knowledge, but these products are changing so rapidly uh, and they're evolving so rapidly. And especially in the last year or two, there's been a big investment in R&D in these things because of the way that the world has become slightly more digital by force. Uh, I think that the answer to that question is still a moving target. And my only suggestion is if you pick a tool that is still being developed and that has enough financial backing behind it that it will continue to evolve, then you have a degree of future-proofing there. If you grab something that is perhaps uh, smaller, cheaper, and maybe more accessible to you, but you, it may or may not evolve as fast as the ideas do. So you're at that stage now where a slightly more mature product, and you've got some examples there. Tableau is an example of an organization that has lots of good stuff on their website because they recognize that their customers have a lot to learn to make best use of their product. And there's quite a few others that are like that as well. Uh, a lot of um, agile project management, workflow management tools that are out there. I didn't want to be mentioning and naming any particular products, but I'm, I'm hoping that some of the others will, that uh, will give you their, their thoughts and experience. Okay, thanks. Kelly's wondering about whether you'd have separate dashboards and reporting if you'd roll business as usual and projects into one planning board and backlog. I'm quite interested in whether uh, business as usual, if you work on several projects, would, would have implications for how you present things. Um, so if you're talking about two different things, if you're talking about would an individual have two different dashboards, uh, they could if they would be tackling two different kinds of project at different days, for example. Um, or, you know, if you really are stuck between two vastly different things, or, or you have a few different projects and you say, right, I need to look at the such and such project now. I've got a dashboard for that. That makes some sense. And that can be beneficial because it's about the mental space. It's about the mental desk, right? And if you, I'm gonna go to this mental desk now because that's where I want my decision-making head to be. And I have a dashboard that answers that. And then another time I need to go into a different mental space and I need a different dashboard to be there that's fine too, as long as you are able to compartmentalize and to control and understand what desks you need. And the desk analogy is perhaps a, a framework or a starting point to help you build that picture and decide, okay, well, what, how many desks do I really need? How many mental desk spaces do I require? But if Kelly's talking about uh, one planning board, if you're talking about a group dashboard, like the sort of thing that's put up on a wall in a, in, a, in a room or an environment that everyone's kind of looking at, that's a little bit different. People aren't generally using that to trigger the what decision. They're usually using that as a collaborative tool to understand the why. So 
the dashboard on the wall in the department's room, that's going to usually be full of why type data that you can all gather around and talk about. The dashboard that you would put up on the boardroom or in the meeting room that you all talk about, that's that again, that's going to be a little different. It's going to be for what decisions, what, what triggers or what why triggers do you need for that kind of environment? But don't rule, don't forget those. You don't just have dashboards for you and me. You have dashboards for us. You have dashboards for this team and a dashboard for that team and an infinite number of dashboards. It takes time to set them all up. But how much time do you get back when you can make better decisions quicker? That's, that's the management trade-off that management is starting to learn and get their head around and decide that actually it's worth spending the time and effort to get all these dashboards set up because they really do help us make better decisions. And I think that answers Dixon's question about uh, the, the dashboards on the screen hanging on a wall now that everyone's working from home or in a hyper office environment worth investing in solutions so that people can access it from anywhere. Yeah, and, and then you say, okay, well, we need, we're going to have a meeting about this People can create dashboards and say, uh, folks, you know, we need to have a meeting to talk about this. I've created a dashboard that I think helps us build a picture of what we need to look at. Now, that's just a starting point, and that dashboard might evolve. But that can be a great, but that is so much better than a slide agenda on a slide deck to say, well, I want to talk about these points. He's like, Here's my dashboard that I've thrown together that I think pulls stuff together and puts it. Like, that's the kind of usability once we get kind of cool and comfortable with how to pl plug these things into place, it can be a much more effective way, especially since we are disparate. We can't walk up to the wall. We can't walk to someone's desk and look over their shoulder. We have to do it digitally. Claire asks, uh, while, while consistency is good, is, is there a risk in stakeholders becoming bored or skimming over the data when working across multiple projects? Yes, subliminal, subliminal ignorance, uh, absolutely. Uh, Claire's got a good point. When you have a dashboard that stays the way it is too long, you do get into mental habits. And one of the antidotes to that is to segregate what's on the screen meaningfully. So when it's, when it's meaningfully segregated, you have a meaningful mental shift as your eyes move around the page. And that gives you a reason to look over there, a reason that transcends whether or not you feel like it, whether or not you have a habit of doing so. So when you can conceptualize a reason to look in a particular area, you can forcibly put your concentration there and see what it might need to tell you and have a protection against the risk of just missing something because you don't generally look at that particular graph very much because it doesn't usually tell you much and you don't have a reason to go there very often. But that segregation is one way of kind of helping. But the other is you can rearrange things, but if you rearrange things too often, you have the reverse problem. You know, you, for any of us who've had the, the inconvenience of getting an update to our software and find that that button isn't where they left it and the frustration that that causes, I've got to find that button or where, where did that thing go? that can be a problem for us as well if we're rearranging our dashboard a little too often. So there's a trade-off between the two. Thank you, Claire. Back to slide 15, I think it was, Jeffrey asks, what's the difference between currency and timeliness? Let's go back there. Where do we say 15? Currency and timeliness. Currency is how up to date the information is, as in when was that information recorded and how likely has it is it to have been changed and become out of date and therefore no longer be accurate. So it is measuring accuracy or the risk of inaccuracy purely based on its age. And timeliness is, can I see that number now? Or do I have to wait till tomorrow before I can see that? Do I need to get approval? Do I need to call someone? Do I need someone to send that to me? Do I need to get someone to set that up so that I can see that? That's timeliness. That's access within a time frame. Currency is how old since that number or since that piece of information was recorded. That's the difference between the two. Thank you, Jeffrey and Brenton. Uh, Hamish asks, have you looked at the Business Agility Institute and the framework they have come up with for aligning agile into management? to organizations? I haven't studied their framework. Um, I think they are an example of 
one of the very good organizations that's trying to create a path. Uh, they are quite big now. Uh, you know, they've got something like 4,000 members. And, you know, when you compare them to some of the, the really big organizations from yesteryear that we think about, uh, you know, with uh, other older or, uh, entities, it doesn't sound like a lot to only have 4,000 members. But I, I think that, uh, I, I think they have some excellent ideas, their framework. I, I, I haven't studied it. I don't know it in detail. Um, if there's similarities, they're not deliberate. Uh, there's likely to be similarities because when you look at the Business Agility Institute and you look at a few others, a few other think tanks that are coming up with the ideas, they're going to have some similarities because they're going to have some, the, the, the fundamental building blocks are the same. They're working with the same ideas, the same opportunities, the same technologies, the same parameters, the same issues. So there's going to be some certain alignment, but there's going to be different ways of going about it. And right now, uh, there's no clear one way of doing it. I mean, we've had project management as a thing for you know 60 years, but there's no one way to do it today. Um, you know, we've had IT service management for years, and there's no one way to do it. There's a popular way to do it, but there's no one way to do it. So this is going to be similar. I, I do think that um, the Business Agility Institute uh, is a great example of something to look at to add value to what you might already know or learn along the way. I don't know them well enough to know whether or not they're going to be all you need. Mm. And I'd be interested, Hamish, in, in whether they have certifications, you know, similar to agile management certifications from PMI, for example, um, and whether we should look at those for, for, I guess, for credit outcomes for potential students, um, always looking at, at things like that. They have, they have a, a library uh, of um, good topics and papers and, and articles, etc. Uh, and they have um, programs, learning programs. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I don't know everything they do with certification. They, they do, there is a agile organization, agile certification. Uh, I, I don't think that, I don't know how popular that is just yet. Uh, but I think these are great things that are coming along and maturing the, and as these, as these ideas become more and more refined, they'll become more and more valuable. And I, I think they're all good instruments at work. Hmm. And I think it's fair to say that our credit program needs to become a bit more agile to <laughs> uh, get with the times, so to speak, and to keep up with just the changes in the way people certify yeah. and, and train. True. If we're, if we're hoping to be the, the business alternate or the bring the business side of things into into university education. Hatim is wondering whether there's any value in having multiple dashboards given from, from their experience. It's, it's rare for decision makers to look at page two onwards, for, so to speak. Um, I guess, is, is this a question of the people accessing the dashboards needing to be educated as to uh, their use and to why they're there? Uh, or is this a sort of a case of the dashboard perhaps not being fit for purpose in helping people make decisions in a in a useful way? Well, I, I answered a question earlier and suggested that in some rare cases for some rare individuals, having more than one dashboard might be appropriate. I do think that would be rare. Uh, I do believe as a rule of thumb, my advice would usually be a single dashboard. I think there is value though in having layers, multiple layers, like a dashboard where you can click and expand and see more. I think that has value because I agree with Hatim's point that um, a lot of people don't ever look at page two. And if you give them a page two that's even one click away, if it's doing the same thing as page one, they won't go there. Uh, page two needs to do something different for them. And that's why I positioned the idea that page one is the what question. What do I have to do? Page two might tell me why. Because once I know what I have to do, I'm willing to go to page two to find out why. And if I know that's where I need to go, I'll go there because that's me doing my job. But if I have two different pages that are both supposed to tell me what I need to do, I, I will often get stuck just because page one is going to give me enough to do, right? Page one is going to fill my day. Uh, so how, what's going to trigger me to go to and look at a second page? And answering that question in that way is a byproduct of having that framework that I shared with you tonight. That's one of the examples of the benefit of the framework to say, okay, here's a reason to structure page one and page two in this way. And that agrees with what Hatim is saying. And it, 
illustrates that point, uh, but now we have a, some kind of solution or an approach that takes that into account. Thank you, Hatim. Do you get many people sort of uh, complaining about dashboards or, or uh, un being unwilling to use them? Is, is it sort of, does it just come back to sort of the, the first couple of weeks of this short course where it's about, you know, ensuring that you, you actually educate and draw people in and sort of build a, a sort of shared vision? Um, dashboards are like a pair of shoes. You, you, probably you wear them until you throw them out? And, and they're, they're, no, they're no, that's, that's very that's last second. Not, not like, <laughs> they, they, they look good when you buy them. They're shiny. They look cool. You think you're going to enjoy them. But when you first try them on, they're not yet quite your shape of your foot. They haven't been worn in. They're not very comfortable. But you have to keep wearing them a while to get used to it. And after a while, they're your favorite things to wear. All right. So there is that journey that we go through. And probably the biggest complaint I've heard from people is that, uh, oh, this is a dashboard. Yeah, it doesn't do much. It tells me stuff that I don't, you know, like, what am I supposed to do with it? It's good to know that, but I don't, what they're saying is that I don't have to make a decision about that data. So it's not the, it's not having a dashboard that's the problem for them. It's the dashboard isn't answering the what question for them. And that's a refinement of what's that dashboard showing them. But once they do that, once they go through the pain of finding and refining what it can tell them, then it becomes something that you you really enjoy and feel comfortable with. And you get to the point where, you know, you really feel good, would perhaps feel a little bit weird, a little bit out of sorts without that. But no dashboard is stuck. It has to evolve. It, it has to evolve just like our job evolves, just like what we do and how we do it evolves. It, a dashboard is a living, breathing thing. And we need to be willing to treat it like one, but we need to have some kind of formula for how it's going to evolve positively. And so hopefully some of what we've discussed tonight is might have given some of you the groundwork for a formula that can help you evolve dashboards, but evolve them in a positive and effective way. Indeed, and, and please feel free to um, continue using the forums while they're still up to, to help you with that. Feel free to contact us if you, if you wanna have a discussion into the future. And if you'd like more help, of course, uh, chuck, chuck the survey thing. Oh, please make Brenton make a subject. That'd be lovely. Because yes, I let us know. <laughs> and and, and as, Anna has, and as Hannah says, forums will be open until the 6th of August. Uh, that'll give us plenty of time to make sure that the course exam is working well, uh, that the course certificate is issued appropriately. Um, might be worth just quickly touching on the exam now for them that are interested. Any questions, chuck it in the chat. Um, Basically, it's a, it's a multi-choice question that we're still in the process of finalizing. It'll probably be released in the next two or three days. Um, wait, what day is it? No, three or four days, I should say. Um, end of the week. End of the week. Um, and then once that's open, you'll have one chance to do it. So don't uh, go off before ready like I would. Do the research, do the revision, look at all of these wonderful resources that Brendan has made for you and for us. It's, it's just been fantastic. I love the audio lectures. Um, you have one hour to do it once you do start though. Um, so if you have any big tech issues during that hour, the clock will keep ticking. So get in touch with us and we can probably organize a reset for you, but we're reluctant to do it. Um, yeah, all multi-choice, all fairly relevant to the webinars. Uh, if you really want to excel, you'll need to look at all of the resources um, to because there will be a few questions based on on some of the further reading and further audio lectures. Uh, and then once you, you've done it, um, we'll have a look at once enough people take the exam and finish the exam and submit the exam, we'll look at making sure all of the questions are performing the way they should. We had a few issues with a couple of questions throughout this course, you know, needing to fix answers. So we'll make sure that there's no issues with that. And then once those questions are sorted and we regrade everything, we'll release the certificates and we'll keep you posted with emails and keep in touch in the forums and sort of say, all right, well, we've got a few more days to do it. There's no due date, just like there's no due date for looking at any of the resources. Everything will be available for the foreseeable future. I think it's just a good idea to, to sort of strike while the iron is hot and get onto it in the next couple of weeks. 
Yes. Don't let it sift out of the mind. Grab it while it's still in there. So if there's anything that needs sorting in the chat, I'll just have a quick look. Yeah, Friday, the date's on the course page. Thanks, and we'll, we'll get that one up there. All of the recordings are available. All of the resources should be available. I'm so keen on, on seeing some of the dashboards that are already in use in some of your organizations. So please put them in the forum if you're able to um, redact them as and when you need to. Um, other than that, just thank you so much, everyone, for, for hanging out and making this a really interesting and um, useful short course. I hope you've all got a lot out of it. Thank you so much, Hannah, for making it possible. And thank you so much, Brenton, for all of your time, uh, all of your you know, commitment and care and endeavor. That's just a, a joy. I'll leave it to you to close out. Thank you, Guy, uh, for all of your wonderful management and uh, emceeing of our courses. Thank you, Hannah, uh, always for your wonderful work in maintaining the portal and managing all of the, uh, the questions, etc., cetera, that, that come streaming through every night. Thank you to all of you for all of those questions, comments, for keeping the chat wonderfully alive. I constantly see it ticking over, which is a healthy, happy thing. And I do hope and ask that you all take the time to fill in the survey and let us know what you think, because that's what goes into my dashboard. And I always love to see what everyone has to say about all of these courses. We do hope to be back again in the near future with another short course or even longer courses. And if you do at some point study with IT Masters, I'm sure you'll bump into me at some point and I look forward to seeing you then. Until then, that's all from me for now. Thank you and good night.